Today's lesson is from Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 through 12, deemed faith in action. Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command, so what, we, what is seen is not, was not what was made out was visible. By faith, Abel brought God a better offering than Cain did. By faith, he was commanded as righteous. When God spoke well of his offerings, and by faith, Abel still speaks, even though he is dead. By faith, Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. And without faith, faith is it impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those for, who earnestly seek him. By faith, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear built an ark to save his family. By his faith, he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that is in keeping with faith. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land, like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with the him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to a city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. And by faith, even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children because she considered him faithful who had made the promise. And so from this one man, and he as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand on the seashore. Here in the readings. Thank you, Dennis. Let us pray. Father, we offer our minds and our hearts to you now. Spirit, you are our teacher. Open up the words of Scripture. Break them open in us in such a way that they produce change. Help us to understand what's at stake. In your name, amen. You can be seated. Good morning, everybody. So, we are moving now slowly but surely through our acronym. Faith is spelled RISK, RISK, R-I-S-K, Relationship, Initiative, Spiritual Gifts, and Kingdom, and we are moving into the I part of the acronym today, Initiative. And because it's Reformation Day, we are, we'll be having some uh, confirmations, actually, at the next service and tonight. I'm very excited about that, but because it's Reformation Day, we're going to be talking about understanding what is at stake, reconnecting perhaps to what is at stake. Now, to get started, let me ask you this question. How many of you adults here have ever had to raise some form of children? Okay? God help you, right? Um, I ran across some interesting pictures that I thought were interesting because of course, the, the art of being a parent, and I use the word art, okay? It's an art form. It's an art form. You, you don't parent by seven easy steps or whatever. There's an art form to being a parent because you're constantly trying to find that balance between nurturing love and disciplined love, and they, they make up love in general, right? And you're always trying to figure out what's the balance between nurture and discipline. And uh, so I, I ran across some pictures of some parents who I thought were pretty savvy at doing this. I call them savvy. They were really good at finding interesting and unique ways to bring about a change of priorities in their children, to perhaps a change of perspective in them, maybe in a sense create a sense of urgency in their children over certain things. Um, we begin with a young man named Keith who apparently has been living at home a little too long, and his parents made him a cake. Time to move out, Keith. Came home, and there was a cake. Now, you might think that's funny, but actually, my old mom and dad who are sitting here kind of did that to me. You did not make me a cake. All I know is I came home one day, and there was just an advertisement cut out sitting on the counter for an apartment for rent. That was it. <laughs> hint, hint. Savvy parents, right? 
Now, let's uh, move away from Keith and let's go back to a smaller child. And these parents, I think, are really interesting because what they did is they found a way to take their child's belief in a mythological character and to use that to produce behavioral change. Here's what I mean. They, there's a little letter. My dearest Emily, I came by tonight to retrieve your tooth and leave your payment. However, because of the condition of your bedroom, I had a horrible time even getting to your bed safely. Once there, I was unable to locate the tooth pillow due to the amount of pillows, blankets, and bodies in your bed. I will have to come by on a different night, perhaps. You can take the time between now and then to properly clean and organize your room. I bet if you ask your mother nicely, she will even help you to do it. Much love, the tooth fairy. <laughs> that is just brilliant, huh? Wish I'd have thought of that. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. And then so we go from Keith, who's living there too long, to Emily, who needs to learn how to clean her room. And then we go into the middle part, the teenagers. <laughs> the teenagers. I'm looking at you, teenagers. I'm staring you down, giving you the stink eye. No. We love teenagers here. Love them, love them, love them, love them. Even if they don't love us that much. Um, yeah. And uh, these parents uh, found a way to use technology to get a message across. So, it's a text string. And so, here's mom texting uh, their child, uh, don't forget to unload the dishwasher. No answer. Did you finish your homework? No answer. We have to go to your grandmother's house for Thanksgiving. No answer. Anybody been through this with their kids? Yeah, right? Dad and I talked. We're going to buy you a car next month. Oh, you are? My God, thank you. <laughs> Miracle, there's an answer. <laughs> oh, and they answered, of course, no, we're not. I just wanted to make sure you were getting my texts. That was cruel. <laughs> it was cruel in all the right ways. Yep. These parents found ways to bring about a change of priorities, a change of perspective, to create a sense of urgency over things that their immature children yet had to learn, right? On this Reformation Day, I think it's our job to let the Spirit do the same to us. What changes of priorities need to happen in us? What sense of urgency needs to be reawakened in us? Do we truly understand and embrace what's at stake? Let's go back to Luther himself. Luther's heart was set aflame. A sense of urgency kindled in him. Not because he saw the glory of the church, but because he saw the corruption of the church and the victims Everyday people, ordinary, everyday good people who were vexed by it, who were put into horrible positions by it, who were taken advantage of by it through the church's uses of indulgences to buy forgiveness. Let's watch the clip as Luther climbs the steps of indulgence. Sound? Do we get some sound? It's, is, it, is it on mute on the computer? Let's go back and try again. Ready? Okay, because it did work at the first service. So. <laughs> name of the deceased in relation, Hendrik Luther, grandfather, and our father on every step. When you reach the top of the stairs, Hendrik will be released from purgatory and enter the gates of heaven. name of the deceased in relation, Wolfram Escher, and our father on every step, 
Two weeks, and scarcely a word, even in the confession. As your father in Christ, I order you to speak. Luther, his heart is set aflame. As he comes to the realization of how poorly the church was representing the beautiful Christ. How distortion and toxicity and corruption had taken something that was free and transforming and amazing and turned it into a business. Luther's heart was broken for the brokenhearted, for the everyday person who he felt needed that connection, that direct connection to Jesus Christ not through some corrupt mediator. Read with me. Psalm 34, 18. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Psalm 51, 17. My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. You, God, will not despise. And so what does it mean to be Lutheran? We start first and foremost always with the question, what does it mean to be a Christian? I don't think that Martin Luther would have cared in any way, shape, or form whether we called ourselves Lutherans. In fact, I think he probably would have been a little repelled by that idea. What he cared about was, do we follow Christ? And are the things that are important to God through Christ Jesus important to us? Are the main things the main things? Are we connected to the brokenhearted of this world? Because we have the hope that they need. Or do we just hide it away in our hearts, grateful for it, but unwilling to share it, either because we're selfish or we're, fear we're fearful? I stands for initiative. There is no risk without the letter I, and there is no faith without risk. Initiative. Initiative. Now, Luther was willing to put his life on the line for this. He was willing to put his life on the line. He was fully aware of what was going on because there was a long line of martyrs that went before him that also challenged the corrupt church. Tried to bring the Scripture in the people's language. And a guy named John Huss in 1415 burned at the stake for doing that. He was well aware of the stakes. But he decided that his life was not too high a price to pay. 
if only the world might know the true and beautiful Jesus Christ. If only the world might not know, might know the freedom of the gospel in its purity and the truth and the absolute stability you can find in the Word of God. Well, I think sometimes we have to think about do we have that sense of urgency these days? Do we? I remember many years ago, um, I was finishing up school at Moorhead State University. I was a senior. And uh, one of my professors was retiring. He had been in education, I think, for about 35, 40 years. He used to be an old big band trumpet player. And he was one of my teachers, my most beloved teachers. His name was Dr. Al Noyce. Uh, Bubba, who was, I think, in the other room, he knew Dr. Noyce really well. He used to work with him out at the International Music Camp. Just loved this man. Hilarious, brilliant, brilliant educator, fun to play for, re really great. Hard driving, tough love kind of guy at times. Loved him. Absolutely loved him. And he was retiring. And I had the honor of being asked to speak to be one of the speakers at his celebration banquet. It was a real honor. I was just super excited to do it. And, and I remember this was a big deal. This was swanky, black tie affair, big banquet. And uh, I didn't even have a tuxedo or anything, so I just did the best I can. I had some black pants, found a white shirt. I had to borrow, I think, a black coat at the time. You know, typical college student. Um, found a tie. And... Uh, my time for speaking came up, and I went up to the podium, and I began to speak. And you know how these things are. It's not a solemn affair. You're, you're remembering, and you're telling funny stories. And, and I'm telling these great stories about Dr. Noyce and these funny stories. And boy, the audience, they're just laughing and laughing. They're having a great time, and I'm just killing it, man. It's awesome. It's great. Dr. Noyce is clearly enter entertained and enjoying himself. But, but it was a little bit off. Just a little bit. Because I noticed that it seemed like people were laughing even when I wasn't saying funny stuff. But you know what? Hey, don't complain, right? Take it where you can get it. Ride the wave. Have a good time with this. I enjoyed it. Did my 10, 12 minutes or whatever. Finished up. Went and sat down. At which point the guy next to me turns around, whispers in my ear, your fly is down. I was wearing a white shirt, black pants, and the corner of my white shirt was sticking through the fly of my black pants. And um, <laughs> and uh, just in case I thought maybe they didn't notice, the podium was a completely clear glass podium top to bottom, uh, kind of a painful, embarrassing moment, so much so that when I preach, if I ever catch my fly down, I even have predetermined things I'm going to say, <laughs> and I've shared them with Scott and Sam, too, just in case. Um, we need sometimes people in our lives to tell us our flies down, right? But let me ask you this question. How many of you have ever noticed that? Maybe you've noticed somebody, their fly was down. Or you noticed that maybe they had a piece of food in their teeth, right? Or they had a little something hanging from their nose. Or maybe their collar was flipped up or something like that, right? And just because you were trying to be nice and polite or maybe you were a little shy, you didn't say anything to them, right? You just kind of, well, I'm just not going to say anything. don't want to make a scene. don't want to embarrass them, right? Raise your hand if you didn't do anything. Raise them high. Yeah, I like to raise your hand. Come on, get them up. Okay, do you see? Do you see all you who have your hands up. Look at everybody else who's lying. We've all been there. Excellent. Yeah, we've all been there. And maybe it's because we're shy. Maybe whatever. But let me, let me flip the script a little bit. Let's say the stakes were different. Let's say this child who's dying of malaria needs a cure. How many of you are going to be shy about doing what's needed? 
you have the cure. There are treatments for malaria, right? How many of you would withhold the cure because you didn't want to make a scene? None of you, right? So my question is, what's the difference between the two scenarios? It's simple, right? One is life and death. Is not the gospel life and death? Hmm? I mean, do we really believe that? Is it not life and death? Shouldn't we be sharing it? I talked a few weeks earlier, right, about that we don't want to be obnoxious because then we damage the gospel, but that we should live the kinds of lives that beg the question, right? But folks, I, I know all of you or a lot of you, and I know that you do that. And so then the question is, do you take the initiative when the question comes? And sometimes the question comes kind of subtly, doesn't it? But the door does open initiative. Take it because it's a matter of life and death. I remember once Bubba told me he had a dream. He woke up in a sweat, bolted straight up out of bed. And the dream was that Jesus had returned. And it was exhilarating and horrifying moment all in one. You know how in your dreams, how your, your emotions just get amplified way, way high, right? And he said, I was sweating and I was absolutely in fear. My heart was just going. And he says, you know why? I says, why? Jesus was coming. He says, because all I could think of was everybody who I didn't tell. That I could have. This is the heart of the Reformation. Have we forgotten that? Maybe. I know, I know, and, and, and I understand, too. Back to savvy parenting. Let me show you another picture. This is good. <sighs> Sometimes a good parent has to force the issue, right? Just has to force the issue. You don't want to get along? Oh, you're going to get along. You're going to get along. I'm going to get you reconnected, even if I have to force the issue. Early in the church's history, God had to force the issue. When we read about the early church after the ascension of Jesus Christ, in the, in the uh, late Gospels, but particularly in the book of Acts and some of Paul's earliest writings, one of the things we see was that the church, though Jesus had commanded the church to go out, and to make disciples, to share the gospel, to baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, the church was huddling together and kind of hiding and staying in Jerusalem. Jerusalem was its comfort zone. But then two things began to happen. And it seems that what Scripture hints at is that these were bad things that God used for a good purpose. Bad things that God used for a good purpose, okay? One of them was famine set in on Jerusalem. A famine set in from Acts. During this time, some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them named Agabus stood up and through the Spirit predicted that a severe famine would spread over the entire Roman world. So people were being forced to leave Jerusalem in search of food, including much of the church, because the church was attempting to take care of each other. You'll notice evidence of this because if you read the epistles, read Paul's letters to the various churches, and go ahead and do that sometime, folks. They're not long. It doesn't take long to read them. One of the things you'll see is that Paul is always talking about taking up a collection. And it's not so they can get a new sound system. It's a collection for the famine, for the church in Jerusalem that is struggling with famine. And he's, and he's calling for the other believers across the Roman Empire to support them. Okay? But a second thing also began to happen, persecution. Persecution began to take root in Jerusalem and began to drive the church outward, drive out Christians who otherwise seemed content to stay. Thomas, Peter, all these other apostles. 
And so God sometimes does that. We are in the midst of big decisions here at Charity. It's not just about how do we accommodate more people. That's, that's the logistical side of the question. The spiritual side of the question is how do we connect more people to Christ? Some of that involves making room here. But a lot of it involves making room here. And when we do that, that means we'll embrace the idea of going out there. We can't be guilty of what the early church did. We can't huddle in our own Jerusalem. We don't get to do that. We need to find ways to go out there more. You need to find ways in your personal life to go out there more, to take initiative, to be sensitive to when the doors are opening, to hear that. So the text that was read concludes with these verses. Read them with me. These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised since God had planned something better for us so that only what? Only what? Together. Together with us. They would be made perfect. I do a lot of reading. I'm a readaholic. I do a lot of reading. Um, I just finished this book. It's by Andrew Claven, and it's entitled The Great Good Thing. A Secular Jew Comes to Faith in Christ. Now, you need to understand something. When a secular Jew, even a secular Jew, comes to faith in Christ, they pay a far higher price than just the normal person. They risk being excommunicated from their community, from their families, from their culture. I know this because I had a couple of uh, stu uh, fellow students in some of my classes who were Messianic Jews. They would come to class. They had the, the yarmulkes, and they had you know, a lot of things. And we would eat lunch together. And, I, boy, I just wanted to pick their brains about what it was like. And one of the things I remember asking them was, tell me your story. Tell me how you got to this place. And they both, I remember, looked at me and absolutely would not tell me. Why? Because it was too painful. And yet they chose the great good thing, still. Andrew Claven is a well-known author, has written several suspense novels and several movie scripts. He's worked with Clint Eastwood on movies and things. He has a blog. He's on TV and radio. Um, I think he appears on Fox at times. Uh, his, and, and this is his story. This is his journey. It's a journey from being raised in a, in a confused, partly atheistic, partly secular Jewish home. His mom was an atheist. His dad was a Jew, but really more culturally, not really in terms of faith but still wanted him to be a Jew. He was angry. His father was a little off kilter, wounds him. He goes through a period of mental illness in his life. And yet, through it all, as he pursues what he feels is his calling as a, as a writer, as somebody who learns to love English literature and all the different stories and, 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 and authors and things, God begins to speak to him begins to whisper to him in his life through the stories, through the pain, through relationships that began to reconcile, through the birth of his first child. And he began to understand something, that his atheism had no answer to the mystery of love. None. That love superseded and overwhelmed every question his atheistic mind could come up with. Every defense, every stiff arm, love overcame it. And he came to realize that if there's really something, this, this thing called love, and it's a real thing, it must come from somewhere. And so began his journey. 
A secular Jew finds Christ. Eventually, he's baptized. Let me read to you the last couple paragraphs of the book. Right now, a lot of you are thinking, I'd like to read that book, and Randy's going to ruin it for me. <laughs> Too bad. He says, I knelt at the baptismal font. He had told his wife and children not to be there because he at that time had felt it was a personal thing. But now he regrets it because he realizes in that moment it's not just a personal thing, is it? Beneath the upraised hand of the bronze statue of John, and now Doug, my pastor, put the water in my head, the oil on my brow, and spoke the words, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And now I climbed to my feet again and looked around me at the faces of my friends in the church's mysterious glowing. And now I saw. I had been wrong yet once more. I had been wrong about baptism as I was wrong about my wedding. It mattered. It mattered in ways I could not understand until the very moment I'd done it. Of course I should have known. Who more than me? Ritual and transition. Symbol and reality. Story and life. They are intimately intertwined forever. They are the language of the imagination, the language in which God speaks to man. Now remember, he's a Jew. He says, well, mine is a stiff-necked people, slow to learn. Yet just as with my wedding, here I was somehow, through my own foolishness and the foolishness of my times, through the fog of my egotism and stubbornness and insanity, God had sung to me without ceasing in the stories I loved and in my love and in my story. I, even half blind with myself, had stumbled after that music and found its source. And somehow, once again... By the hilarious mercy of God, I had made my way to the great good thing. That's what's at stake. And it's everything. It's everything. And life will never make sense until that everything shows itself. And we have the privilege of sharing it. Amen? Stand for the benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May He make His face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May He lift up His countenance upon you and give you His peace. May you take initiative. May you understand what's at stake. May the sense of urgency be rekindled in your heart as you go about into this world, a world that's hurting, a world that needs to know Him, a world that needs the great good thing. May the Spirit give you courage and ears to hear and eyes to see. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.